where did we use random numbers? One-time pads. One-time pad, where else? What? Keys. Keys in general, right? All the keys we talked about, symmetric keys for sure. We wanted Alice and Bob to share a symmetric key. We said, hey, generate a random symmetric key and distribute it to Alice and Bob. Uh, so that, how about public key cryptography? You better choose, I mean, you choose primes, right? But you better choose those at random from amongst a large set of possible primes or else Trudy could just guess your primes, right? Without actually factoring the modulus. So it's important that you choose random numbers, not only in symmetric keys, for symmetric keys, but also for, say, RSA. <coughs> okay, now random numbers come up in a lot of contexts. Okay, if you ever take a statistics class, you often generate random numbers to do certain experiments. Okay, now those random numbers, they need to be statistically random. They need to satisfy certain statistical properties about the mean and the distribution and the variance, all those kind of things. Of course, that's not good enough for cryptographers, okay? We need more. Okay, and what more do we need? What has to be true about random numbers that you use in cryptography? Well, they do need to be statistically random, okay? They satisfy all these nice statistical properties, but what else has to be true? Or what? The number never comes up again. Uh, we can't really prevent it from ever coming up again, right? But random is different from statistical properties. If you use a generator or something, a sequence that, or a known sequence, uh, that, that's one thing. The other thing is that you've got to be sure you have the big set you're choosing. Well, that's true. Okay, we need a large set that we're choosing from. Uh, but you know, the statistical random number generator generates a 32-bit integer. You know, they're uniformly distributed amongst all the 32-bit uh, Okay, that's the key word I'm kind of looking, fishing around here for, is unpredictable. Okay, they need to be unpredictable. Why is that? Well, uh, well, okay, just go back a second here. If you look at the techniques that are used to generate random numbers, you know, your random number generator and whatever your favorite programming language is, it is very, very predictable. Okay, if you give me a sequence of numbers you know, that you produce with it, I can tell you what's going to come next. And I can tell you all the rest of the numbers that are going to come next. Okay, it's very predictable. Okay, now, why would that be bad for cryptographic applications? Well, let's look at this scenario. Let's suppose we've got a server that generates symmetric keys. That's as common. So you go to the server, and, you know, start of the day, you get your symmetric key. Okay, so Alice goes and gets her symmetric key, call it case of A. Bob goes and gets his symmetric key. What should we call that? Case of C. All right, you guys are catching on. Okay, and Charlie gets his key, case of C. Dave gets his key, case of D. Now, let's suppose Alice, Bob, and Charlie, they really don't like Dave. Okay, so what could they do? They could all three get together, compare their keys, and say, hey, can we use these three keys together to guess what Dave's key might be? In other words, can we predict Dave's key based on the keys we've seen? And it doesn't just have to be three. They might be able to get millions of keys before they see Dave's key. And if they can guess Dave's key with better than random chance, you know, they've got a better attack than they should have to recover Dave's key. Okay, so unpredictable. That's the crucial thing. We don't want to be able to guess, no matter how many previous keys we've seen or random numbers we've seen. Uh, okay, now this is not exactly a cryptographic application, but I kind of like it. It shows the risks or dangers of not generating your random numbers very well. Um, if you watch TV at all, you can't help but see this Texas Hold'em poker. Okay? It's on all odd hours of the day. Uh, and the way this game works is they deal each player two cards face down, right? And then there's a round of it. Okay, then three cards go up, face up in the middle, another round of betting. One more card, face up in the middle, another round of betting. One card, face up in the middle, another round of betting. Anybody who's still left, the winner is the one who can make the best five card poker hand from the five in the middle plus their two cards. Okay, so that's the way it works. Now, okay, so this company, this is several years ago. You can play this online, right? Lots of online poker places. Anybody play? I actually had a student, uh, probably, this was a few years ago, when this wasn't quite so popular, maybe. 
But um, he claimed he played online for like a year, made like $100,000, and the next year he lost it all. And he about went nuts in the process, so he never played again. <laughs> There's a lot of money right there. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so there's this company, um, AFS Software, that made an online version of this game. All right. Now, where do you need random numbers if you're doing this in a program? You have to shuffle the cards, right? First of all, first thing that has to happen, shuffle the cards. How many different shuffles are there of a card, deck of cards? What? 52 factorial. Okay, 52 factorial is a huge number, all right? Excuse me. Uh, if you write it in terms of bits, it's more than 225 bits. Now, if you look, uh, there are standard algorithms to generate shuffles or to generate permutations, okay? And it's to generate a random permutation is not really that difficult, okay? There's a nice algorithm uh, to do it. These guys didn't know the nice algorithm. <laughs> Okay, so what they did in their program is they used a random 32-bit integer to generate the shuffle. Now, what's wrong with that? Less possible. Not only is there less, there's way, way, way less. <laughs> there's only 2 to the 32 possible. And this is a huge, enormous number, right? This is only like 4 billion. So the most different shuffles you could possibly get is 4 billion different shuffles. Okay, then it gets even worse. Okay, they, this was written in Pascal, and they used the Pascal randomized function. Now, if you're going to use a, a pseudo-random number generator on your computer, what, what do you need? You need a seed. You need a seed value. Where does that seed value come from? Well, what they did is they, took the, they looked at the server, they looked at the clock, right, and took the number of milliseconds since midnight as the seed. Problem is, there's only 2 to the 27 milliseconds in a day. So they can only have 2 to the 27 different possible seeds. So that means they can only have at most 2 to the 27 different possible shuffles. Okay, now if you were, you know, that's, that's good. I mean, you got it down to a relatively small, you know, what, an eighth of a billion or something number of possible shuffles. But can you do better? Okay, you're the bad guy. You're trying to figure out what the shuffle is. You know all this information. Can you reduce the number of possible shuffles even further? Yeah, okay, you could try to synchronize with the server's clock, right? Okay, you may not get it exactly, but you can do better than just randomly guessing any time during the day. And what these people found who actually analyzed this is that they needed about 2 to the 18 different values. Okay, so they could get it down to about 2 to the 18 different C values. That's only a quarter of a million. Okay, that's a pretty small number. So now what? Call your friends and ask them to play poker. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, so what they did is um, the initial deal, right, you get to see two cards. That's it. That was not enough to, de to uniquely determine the shuffle. So they bet the first round. <laughs> then three cards show up in the middle, and you could uniquely determine the shuffle from amongst the two to the 18 possible candidates with three cards up in the middle. Now, how can you lose, right? You know exactly what everybody else has, you know exactly what cards are gonna show up, you know exactly when to bet, when not to bet. It doesn't get any better than that. All right. Okay. Do you happen to know how much money was made with this scheme? <laughs> you know, this was like some, uh, some security researchers who posted this. I don't think they actually ever, ever uh, well, at least they didn't claim to ever actually have uh, run the attack in practice. Okay, so that's a pretty extreme example by any measure, right? I mean, they took 2 to the 225 and made it look like 2 to the 18. You know, it's hard to even imagine doing worse than that. But, you know, sort of back to the uh, crypto scenario, we need unpredictable random numbers. Pseudo-random number generators are predictable, okay? So how do we get the unpredictable numbers? Well, okay, here's a thought. You know, if you think of something like RC4, okay, the RC4 stream cipher generates a sequence of bytes. Those bytes are unpredictable, okay? And that's gotta be true of any decent stream cipher, 
Why does it have to be true? If not, a known plain text attack would be devastating. Okay, think about it. If someone knew some of the plain text, they get to see the cipher text. So what do they know in a stream cipher? They know the key string, right? Just XOR those two guys together, you get the key string. If they could take some of the key stream and recover more of the key stream, you're hosed. Okay, the cipher's broken. Okay, you can't do that for any decent uh, stream cipher. RC4 is a pretty good stream cipher. Okay, so that means the stream here that we generate from an RC4 cipher is pretty unpredictable. Hey, that's what we're looking for. Problem solved, right? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, we still need a key for the RC4 generator to get the whole thing started. Basically, it's taking the role of the seed, right? And that better be unpredictable or the rest of the sequence is predictable. Okay, so we need some, you know, unpredictable numbers no matter how you get it, no matter how you look at it. Um, okay. So how can we do that? How can we get some real random numbers? I want something really random. And how do I get those? <laughs> okay, I mean there are. That's true. Okay, so there are, there are uh, uh, ways to get truly random numbers. Uh, my favorite example is radioactive decay. You know, if you hold a Geiger counter, the uh, spacing between the clicks. Okay, that's as random as you're going to see in, in uh, nature. So I got this problem solved. All we need to do is put a little block of plutonium inside everybody's computer, <laughs> and we can generate all the random numbers we need. Okay, we're good to go. <clears throat> okay, well that might not be a, much of a selling point for your <laughs> computers. So probably that's not going to work. There are hardware devices um, that um, use, uh, like they have disks spinning and things like that. So physical properties that are very chaotic or very unpredictable, and you can actually generate a, a large number of um, good, uh, unpredictable random bits that way. Uh, you can look this one up, the lava lamp online. That's a chaotic process. Um, and they actually have, it's still there, but they had a lava lamp up online and they would actually generate random numbers <laughs> from it. I wouldn't recommend using specifically those random numbers because they're posted online, but uh, the idea is sound. Okay, now suppose you need to generate some random numbers. You need a key, you know, every day for your use, you know, 128-bit DES key or uh, AES key or something. You go to your boss and you say, hey, you know, I need one of these fancy devices that generates random numbers because I want to generate a key. And your boss says, forget it, that costs money, figure out a better way to do it. And so how are you going to actually get some random bits that you can use as a key? By a lot of them. By, by your own lava lamp. By a lava lamp. Yeah, I got a little lava lamp on my desk. <laughs> that would work. Um, okay, but we were thinking here through software. Okay, so you've got some program set up, and you want to just you know pull off some random bits that you can use reasonably use as a ring, as a as a key or something like that. You can't really do it directly from your software. Your software is supposed to be deterministic. If it's not, you've got bigger problems that you can have to solve here. Um, so you have to rely on some sort of external events. Things that could work are keyboard dynamics, okay, how you strike the keyboard. If you do that at sort of fine enough resolution, it's probably there's some random bits there. If you look at where the mouse moves, okay, now in the big scheme of things, it probably it could be in a similar region a lot of times, but if you go to a very fine level, okay, exactly where it is, you know, the low order bits, you can probably get some real random bits there. Okay, so kind of the bottom line here is that you can actually generate some high quality random bits just by looking at things, you know, network activity and such that goes on in your system all the time. The problem is quantity. If you get greedy and you start taking more and more bits, then you're starting to get into the region where some of these things are going to be predictable. You know, think of the mouse. The finer points exactly where the mouse is, that's probably unpredictable. But in a larger scheme, you know, where is it? Is it in the upper left corner? That might be predictable. Okay? So you've got to be a little careful. Uh, the bottom line, okay, I like this quote. Didn't know where else to put it. So the use of pseudo-random processes to generate secret quantities can result in pseudo-security. 